Välkomna till Folkets Radio. Welcome to the Public Radio. Today with a great Gnostic scholar and comparative mythologist, John Lamb Lash. It's great to have you with us again, John. Good to be here. So we have done several interviews where John has talked about the ancient mysteries, the Gnostic teachings about the divine power of our planet, about the mind parasites called archons. And I really encourage everyone to watch these interviews on this channel to get more out of this one. So uh, the topic of today's conversation is simulation, a topic very much in vogue in the mainstream and also in the alternative space. Lately, uh, some researchers claim we live in a simulation and some of them like David Icke claim to base this assumption on the Gnostic teachings. So does this extremely demoralizing theory have any truth to it, or is it just a psyop to make us feel disempowered? Well, John, before we dive into all this, when the, the Gnostics were persecuted and eventually almost exterminated by the Roman church in the early days of the Christian era, they burnt the libraries and destroyed the mystery schools. And also, have you have explained that they put a certain spin on the Gnostic worldview a worldview which is sort of distorted and still very much promoted today. Maybe for the background, if you could explain that, how did they put a spin on it and what did they change? Well, I've talked about that spin a lot. Hmm. I call it the patristic straw man argument. Patristic refers to the early church ideologues, the church fathers. They had a case against the Gnostics. And most of what we know, a lot of what we know about the Gnostics does not come from the Gnostics, but from the opposition. And the argument that comes from the patristic writings uh, is a straw man argument. In other words, it misrepresents what the Gnostics actually said. And it does it in the manner that some of your listeners will be familiar with today, if you follow the mainstream media, you know that the, the modus operandi of the enemies of life and the deceivers and misleaders is to invert something. So they take something like, for instance, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is essential to life, essential to carbon-based life forms. We breathe it and they invert it. And so now it's a toxin, yeah. you see? Well, they, the church fathers, the early ideologues who hated the Gnostics because they couldn't win an argument with them, uh, inverted the Gnostic message. And basically they said that the Gnostics taught that we are trapped in a matrix, a simulated reality due to the archons and that the archons created everything that we perceive to be real and it's phony it's fake it's mm -hmm. a simulation and they said that the gnostics condemned the world because the world is the product of a demiurge who has trapped us in this simulation it is not what they said not at all what they said was that this natural world you live in is actually the manifestation of the wisdom goddess. It is her dream, it is her projection. And that when you know that, you have a standard of reality to compare to the simulation of the archons. So they did not deny that the archons are attempting to program us by a simulation. Mm -hmm. But they said, you can only know what the simulation is and how it works by comparing it with the wonder, splendor, an absolutely genuine material reality of nature. Mm -hmm. So they completely inverted the Gnostic message and turned it into something life-hating, nature-hating, and the rest is history. Yeah. A bit similar to what the church fathers themselves were promoting, that the earth is sinful and so on, right? Exactly. It, they did that because it fits their agenda that nature is evil. Yeah. 
But they claim, falsely claim, that the Gnostics taught that nature is evil. It is the product of the archontic demiurge. They did not say that. They said nature is the body of your divine mother, the wisdom goddess. It is not a product of the archons. No. You have explained this. They had this notion in Coptic, the word hal, which means pretty much like virtual reality. And this is sort of a, a trap that the, Nost that the, the archons are trying to impose on us, not only as a simulation, but also in, in many ways just to make us go astray. So could you maybe explain how how this co what this concept is and also how they can ha could have a notion of virtual reality, although they were, so, so to speak, pre-technology? So how means exactly what it says. How means simulation. Hmm or virtual reality. So imagine that you and I were taking a walk in the woods together hmm. at some beautiful fjord or some down in the coast of Sweden, and we're there in the beauty of the natural world, in our senses, in our bodies, everything is real. Everything is material real, materially real. What your senses show you is real. You taste it, you smell it. It's not an illusion. And then imagine that somewhere uh, on some extraterrestrial broadcasting platform, which literally is Saturn. From this broadcasting platform of Saturn, the Archons are sending in a signal. That is how. And what they attempt to do when they can break into the human mind with that signal, they would then say, try to project around us uh, another reality, which is not the true reality. So they try to intrude with a simulation, trap us in that simulation so that we do not any longer see the reality that we are actually in. That's mm -hmm. how they do it. And they do it through, it's a faculty. How is their faculty? It is the faculty to induce virtual reality hallucinations. Mm -hmm. the, this claim, that uh, we we live in a in a simulation has been very hyped up recently. A recent cover of Scientific American, the magazine said, <laughs> confirmed we live in a simulation. And I quote: Ever since the philosopher Nick Bostrom proposed that the universe and everything in it might be a simulation, there has been intense speculation and debate about the nature of reality. Such public intellectuals as Tesla leader Elon Musk have opined about the statistic inevitability of our world being little more than cascading green code. Uh, so that kind of talk. But I mean, Scientific American, Elon Musk, they're all representatives of the establishment of the powers that be. But this theory has also been heavily promoted lately by, by the popular dissident and conspiracy researcher, David Icke. So I would like to play you a short clip and have you comment on it because he, he as you're gonna hear, he's trying to base his claims on the Gnostic teachings. So you had this treasure trove of documents that were found at Nagamadi uh, in uh, 1945, about 75 miles north of Luxor in Egypt, which was an earthen jar of the writings of the Gnostic people. And it's reckoned that they were put in that jar 400 AD, something like that. And about a fifth of these writings were about what they called archons, which is Greek for rulers, um, who were manipulating human society. And what they say in these writings is that this world is a fake world. It's a fake reality created by this archontic force to enslave humanity in an illusion. I went through all of them and what you see they're describing a virtual reality universe. That's what they're describing in their own language, what we would call today virtual reality. One of the great things today is that because of the technological advancement, so-called, we've now got the analogies and the, the experience of virtual reality to actually describe what this reality is. Three quick points, if I may. Yeah. First point is, David Icke says explicitly, one fifth of the Gnostic materials is about the archons. Mr. Ike, if you're listening, may I ask how you know that? Because that's what I said. 
And if you were honest, you would say, according to Gnostic scholar John Lash, one fifth of the material in the Nag Hammadi is dedicated to the Archons because I'm the one that said that, okay? Second point is, he's just repeating the straw man argument as if it were the message of the Gnostics rather than the message against them. Hmm. And the third point is, he's entirely wrong in assuming that this situation of archontic intrusion applies to the whole universe. Fuck no, if you pardon my English. It does not apply to the whole universe. It only applies to conditions particular to our solar system. And the Gnostic cosmology makes that really, really clear. So the entire universe is not a simulation. This is nonsense. This is complete irresponsible bullshit. Hmm. Yeah, and, and so what this is, of course, comes into the domain of, of speculation, but um, what is your take? I mean, is he sort of a, a true rebel who just hasn't done his homework on, on the Gnostics, or is he deliberately spreading this as a psyop? No, I don't think it's a psyop he's deliberately spreading. I don't even think it's maybe a psyop Bostrom or these other masterminds uh, are spreading. Uh, I think it's a mistake. Okay. They've got it wrong. And they are propagating an error. And it's not, I don't blame the archons for the error that they're propagating. They're human beings. They're intelligent. They're responsible yeah. to find the truth. So I put it down to error. That's all. Yeah. Human error. Human error. I'm asking because it's logical that, you know, Christian scholars and people of power like Elon Musk would promote this version to sort of contain the Gnostic message. But somebody like David Icke, who have for decades had been an out brave and outspoken critic of basically everything in the establishment, the educational system, the media system, the banking system. And, and there he, here it just becomes like a parrot of this, uh, the early church fathers. One thing you have to realize, one thing I don't, you have to, don't have to realize anything, but one thing that I might okay, is that when, he wrote his first books and he talked about the Rothschilds and he exposed the banking system and he went into the facts of history. Mm -hmm. He was like an investigative reporter doing a very good job mm -hmm. to lay the groundwork for investigations which have been ongoing. But his investigations of history and the evil agenda of the authorities and the financial overlords and all of that is verifiable. Uh, that has nothing to do with the paranormal. Uh, if I leave you with any message at all, I leave you with this question. David Icke has proved trustworthy in some of his research. I totally respect that. But when David Icke talks about the paranormal, does he know what he's talking about? Hmm. You're going to talk about the paranormal. Yeah. And the archons, and the occult nature of reality, which we'll get to at the end of this talk, mm. if you remind me, which is yeah. about how this entire beautiful, brilliant living movie that we're in is projected, where it is projected from, then we're talking psychonautics and shamanism. And as far as I know, Neither David Icke nor anyone else who's promoting the simulation theory has qualifications to talk about the psychonautic and shamanic dimensions mm. of human experience because they have never proved to me by anything they have said that they have actually experimented psychonautically. And I have talked about my own experiences extensively. Mm -hmm. So everyone knows where I'm coming from. Uh, and I don't hear them saying anything. You know, David Ike is advising people on the operations of the paranormal. Mm -hmm. What does he know about the paranormal? What do you know about it, David? Give us a direct first person testimony. Mm -hmm. Have you gone into the supernatural? 
the Nahual? Have you gone there? How did you go there? What did you see there? See, mm. all this is lacking. And although he may have proven trustworthy in other respects, I have no trust whatsoever for his capacity to talk about paranormal experiences. Yeah. And also, I mean, in this Gnostic message, which he delivers, the only way basically is sort of, he talks about how to get out of here. It's like in the Buddhist, you know, from Nirvana, he doesn't say anything about the divine nature of this planet of Sophia, how to connect with it. And I say, why do we keep reincarnating here? Well, because we belong here. I mean, so, so he doesn't really seem to have any grasp on the whole Gnostic message in that sense. No, if you just repeat the straw man argument against the Gnostics, mm. it shows that you don't see their true message, nor even as well, their true technique, because they were psychonauts, they were masters of parapsychology and the paranormal. And what about all that intel that they had? Mm. Why doesn't that come forth into the discourse about simulation? Mm. I just want to read you one more quote from this uh, article in Scientific American. It says, all our worst fears about powerful forces at play controlling our lives, unbeknownst to us, have now come true. And yet this absolute powerlessness, this perfect deceit offers us no way out in its reveal. All we can do is to come to terms with the reality of the simulation and make of it what we can. And what comes to my mind when I hear that, uh, you have talked about several times, and I think also written about that, the archons and, and the forces of power use a certain amount of bluff. If they can make us believe that we are made in their image, if they can make us believe that they have hacked into our genome, they get a certain advantage. If this is something similar here at play, that by making us believe that we, are, we live in the simulation, we are completely powerless, it gives some kind of a advantage to the that statement is typical of countless statements that come out every day mm. 7 24 <laughs> and these statements are coming from the transhumanist technocrats the authorities yeah. and it's what i call threat display yeah. it's a threat. there's a threat in that statement and it's a bluff and i assure you i have a rule i don't make a threat unless I can back it up. If I threaten you and tell you I'm gonna knock your face in, you can believe that I'm gonna be able to back it up. But their, their threats are empty threats. They will never back this up. They can't. They're losing control of their illusion of power. And all they can do is bluff and threaten and intimidate in the desperate attempt to try to keep people in under control by fear but there's nothing to be afraid of. It's not a perfect deceit. It's a shit show. Mm. And it's so stupid and obvious that anyone with common sense can see it falling apart. Yeah. In fact, it's becoming, it's falling apart mm. so fast that they cannot maintain their pretense. You see, they, re they rely on power and let's admit it, let's be real. In some respects, they have power. So they control the media, they control Twitter, they control uh, the banks, the education, you know, up to a point they do. Let's give them that. Yeah. But their influence really relies more on not the actual power that they have, but the illusion of power. They have to project the illusion of total power. And that is what that stupid comment is saying. That's you said once, I think that was in an interview with Lisa Harrison, that in the end, these, these transhumanists, they will fail because real power is about power sharing. They are not sharing power. They're just sort of manipulating and trying to sort of control other people, right? Yeah. And real power, if you have real power, then what's the proof that you have it? You know, I claim to have real power. Knowledge is power, but power is also skills. So I claim to have power and skills. I've done this a lot. I'm completely open. Like I say, 
I keep all my pretenses out in the open. You don't have to guess about me. I'll tell you exactly where I'm at, right? And when I say that, I suggest that you ask yourself the question, well, here's a man and he's claiming that, but what is he based it on? It's very simple, my friends. I base it on the same premise that it has for you. You know you have power when you are bonded to the source of power. And what is the source of my power? It's the earth, the planet, the living body of the goddess. That's the source of my power. That's the source of the only power that you will ever have. That's the power that keeps you alive every moment of your day. Do you not think that the power that births you into this world and gives you breath every day is not the same power that gives you knowledge and that gives you the strength to face the authorities and their deceit. It's the same power. So when you bond to the source of power, then you are part of the solution. But I don't see David Ike saying that because what's the source of his power? I don't have any idea. Returning to this um, idea of a matrix, uh, what do you think about the Hollywood movies, The Matrix? Have you, what is your take on on them? Well, of course, I agree with others and with David Icke that it, it's a meme. It became a meme, The Matrix. But even before it became a meme, you actually can find The Matrix literally in the Nag Hammadi writings in their cosmology. There's a word in their cosmology. It's a Greek word, stereoma. Stereoma. And this word has been translated by Judeo-Christian scholars who have several layers of glasses on that would come out a yard from mine. And they translate it as the fundament. Now, the fundament is a term from the early translations into English of the Christian Bible, and it means the firmament, the firmament or the fundament. They translate it the firmament, the heavens. But you see, the stereoma is very clear from the material, if you read it correctly, that the stereoma is not the firmament. It is not the totality of the heavenly worlds, the, the, the constellations, the, the galactic arms, the galaxies floating in infinite sense. No, no, no. The stereoma is a particular area within our solar system that was created by the archons for their habitat. And so the stereoma is, in a sense, you could say, the foundation of their existence and it is where they have their reality, which they try to falsely project upon us, you see? Mm. So this is really important because already in the Gnostic Intel, if you read it correctly, you find that there is everything you need to know to deconstruct and debunk simulation theory. Now, getting back to the Matrix film, even though that uh, established a meme, which everyone knows now, I'm saying the meme was already given to us by the, by the uh, Gnostics mm -hmm. before, but they established the meme in public imagination through the medium of cinema, which is probably the most powerful medium of programming, predictive programming, they established a false representation of the stereoma. Mm -hmm. So go and look at the matrix and what do you see? Well, Neo, when he takes the red pill, learns what reality is, that he's like an overgrown human embryo. By the way, the image of the overgrown human embryo is also given in the Gnostic writings, mm -hmm. in the hoo -ha. Yeah. Premature fetus. Yeah. Oh, he's just a human embryo locked in these enormous banks and wired up so that he can provide energy, right? Mm -hmm. And then you see that's one part of the matrix, right? And then and that's supposed to be the real. That's what's really happening. The archons have taken over the earth and they've converted it into a battery system, right? Yeah. 
well, why why do they need the earth for a battery system? Anyway, let that go. And then, oh, the other thing is there are people walking around in the matrix thinking they're living in the real world and eating and drinking. And actually that's just a false uh, simulation that the, uh, that the creators of the matrix give to their batteries uh, so that they pl can placate them while they are sucking all their energy away. Yeah. Well, you see, that doesn't quite work. And I'll tell you why. Because if the, uh, who, who does the matrix uh, designate, by the way, as the creators of this nightmare? Does it name them? I can't remember. It's an alien species of some kind, right? Yeah. Have taken over the earth, mm -hmm. transformed human beings into batteries, Okay, well, the problem is that if that alien species then simulates this real world, cities, towns, parks, all the settings of the natural world, that they, they allow the uh, captured humans to believe that they are in, if that is a simulation, what's it a simulation of? Exactly. You see, it doesn't work. It's no, brilliant. Work. It's a wedge that has been put into human imagination. It's got people thinking, but it doesn't really work. No. I can show you why. Hmm. Very simple. This is the argument against simulation. Right? Okay, sure. Here you go. <laughs> see that? Yeah. 100 bucks. That's a hundred dollar bill. Yeah. A Ben Franklin. Okay. Imagine we're in the same room. We're not in a virtual setting. I give it to you. I give you this. You hold it up. Yeah. Okay, my friend. Tell me, is it counterfeit or not? Well, I just have to know the original then, yeah? To know it. You have to know the original. Unless you have an original bill that is real and you put it side by side with the counterfeit bill, yeah. how can you know it is real? Unless there is an original of the simulation, yeah. how can we know it's a simulation? That's the basic flaw in this theory. Yeah. And I know no one who can refute that argument so <clears throat> far, but nobody talks to me, so mm -hmm. the hell do I know? Nobody argues with me openly about simulation theory. I'm grateful for the opportunity even to discuss it with you. Uh, but there's another movie which has gotten much less attention, which is called They Live from 1988 by, by John Carpenter, where this guest worker realizes that the world is being run by aliens who are sort of in, in working together with, with the oligarchic elite. And then he gets these glasses on so he can, through the, the lens of truth, he can see behind this manufactured reality.
Yeah. You know, so many years ago, did a clip from that movie with a voiceover from me. All right. Really? Yeah, talking about taking down the archons, right? Okay. And it's, it's a great line when he goes into the bank mm. and he says, I'm going to kick ass and chew gum, and I'm straight out of gum. Yeah. So that's where I'm at right now in life, you know. I'm straight out of not chewing gum. I'm here to kick ass. Mm. And I'm wearing my They Live glasses. You are absolutely right. That is probably the most brilliant uh, predictive programming uh, to prepare us to face the archons, you say, and defeat them. Yeah. And uh, it is it, it really stands up uh, over the years. <clears throat> but there's one thing that I would point out from that movie is that when you look through the, you know, the those sunglasses, uh, you don't need the sunglasses, which I wear for other reasons, uh, to see the archons. If you can't see the archons in reality, in your neighborhood, in politics, in business, if you can't see them, it might be too late for you because they're all over the place and they are very obvious. Mm -hmm. They are people who follow rules, who ty tyrannize you with authority, who are brainwashed, cannot say anything that's a stupid, not stupid, something they repeated from someone else. The archons are among us. They are human beings who have fallen into the archonic deceit. And in certain respects, they have lost their humanity. And I would add, uh, don't bother to be compassionate about them. Hmm. Before we wrap up, you recently posted a very interesting piece in your school, Nemeta, nemeta.org, for anybody who wants to check it out. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so it was, I'm not going to try to to do it justice, but it was something about an archontic invisible headset, which which sort of distorts certain emotions. Can you explain? Yeah. It's called uh, the Five Skull Crown Instruction. And it plays off a trope from Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. If you look into the iconography of Tibetan Buddhism, into the Tonkas and the illustrations, you find that there are many, many thousands, of course, illustrations of deities and the Dakinis and so forth, gurus. But there's a class, and they are called the Dangerous Guardians. And they are demonic, fierce demonic beings, but they are protective of human sanity. They are not against humanity. There's nothing to be afraid of. They are your protectors. They are called dangerous protectors. And they typically wear a skull crown that has a large skull in the center and two others here over the eyes and two around toward the ears. So I explain and I translate in Gnostic terms what is the meaning of this five skull crown. And the way I do so is I say that the, the effect of the archons upon us can be imagined in this way. You know, a certain individual whom I won't name, whose name begins with Z, proposed a metaverse. What is he proposing? Oh, you don't have to live in the real world anymore. You don't have to hug your pets. You don't have to go outside and smell the trees. Just put on the headset and join the metaverse. And then you can have everything. So using that analogy, I say, uh, the, uh, the influence of the archons is as if they put that virtual reality headset on everyone. And that headset has specific functions, five specific functions, which I described in detail. And it is due to these specific functions of the headset that your that human reality becomes distorted and it's toxic. It becomes toxic. And the beauty of the instruction of the five skull crowns is to how to recognize and convert those toxins into elixirs into elixirs of enlightenment because the five skull crown is what you put on 
that destroys the Arconic headset. And I've been writing about that lately with great pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I consider it, you know, in the top material of, of uh, Gnostic Intel that I've been able to put out through my school. It's a beautiful analogy and it works. It's not theoretical, it's not metaphysical. You can test it because it has to do with toxic emotions such as shame and guilt. And it has to do with attitudes of seeing other people, such as the attitude of entitlement. See? Now, when I look at you, if I look at you as one human being to another, in the absolute purity of what we are, magical children of the wisdom goddess, then I don't look at you with entitlement. I don't project to you that I am entitled to anything, nor are you entitled to anything. But the toxic influence of the Arconic headset introduces this uh, factor of entitlement. So the instruction shows how to recognize that and how to dissolve it and replace it with an attitude of enlightenment. So there are specific correspondences between the five toxins of the Arconic headset and the five elixirs of enlightenment that you gain by putting on the five skull crown. But when you put on that crown, you become a dangerous protector. Great. So just take one, one concrete example. So how, for instance, do you mas get a mastery from differentiating, let's say, uh, I mean, sometimes you should feel guilt if you did something wrong to someone. True. It's a natural thing to have, a, if you have a conscience. Where this gets distorted into this sort of archontic shame. Well, as I said, I can only give you a glimpse here. Mm. It's, 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 yeah. it's quite quite a piece of work. It's a but, talk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a glimpse. You see mm. the two parts of the archonic headset that go over your ears, right? Mm. So if if you had a metaverse VR headset, it goes over your ears too, because you don't hear anything in the house. You don't hear the cat. You don't hear the rain. You hear what it's the input from the headset. The, your two ears are instruments that register an emotional factor that is inherent to human experience. One of them is guilt and one of them is shame. Now it is true that there are natural and good and sane forms of guilt and shame. There is natural good shame. Children have it. When someone violates the boundaries of a child's shame, they need to know it, you see? And there is natural guilt, which is just another word for responsibility. So if I do something wrong, you know, if I actually make a mistake or do harm to someone, I am responsible. I am guilty for what I do. Mm -hmm. But what the archonic headset does is it comes in and it distorts those emotions so that you no longer know what is your natural shame, what is your natural guilt. You're operating on what you hear from outside because it's on the ears. So what you hear is, uh, you should be ashamed. You should be ashamed of this. You should be ashamed of that. It's all lies. It doesn't tell you what to really be ashamed of. That's the jamming of the iconic forces into the headset. So when the instruction teaches you to recognize the jamming, and when you clear the jamming, then you reclaim the power of those natural faculties. And that's where the elixirs of enlightenment become part of your crown and you wear that crown as a dangerous protector of truth, innocence, beauty, goodness, delight, pleasure, freedom, all those good things. They haven't gone away. You know, they haven't gone away. They're still here, but you have to fight for them now. But I would like to close with one other point. There is another series of talks and writings that I'm releasing on Nemeter right now, and it is called Cosmic Projection. And Cosmic Projection is a term from that I take from the Hindu Vedic seers, the rishis, the great mystics of the East, which, which they called the Parinama. Now the Parinama explains what David Icke cannot explain, what David Icke doesn't know. I don't think he's intentionally misleading anyone. I think he's just an ignorant fool. 
when it comes to the basics of what is this reality that we're in. And so the Parinama explains the entire process of cosmic projection that places us in the natural world, in the material world, and how it works, and how we are involved in that projection, and how we can actually act within the projection. And it, it, it is a, you could say, a complete metaphysical paradigm, which, if you had that paradigm, you would then be able to see what a complete fraud and mistake you find in simulation theory. This is not a simulation. I'm not a simulation here in flesh and blood, in this room, in this field, in this house, in this country, on this planet. None of it is a simulation. But in order to know that profoundly, uh, you would have to know, well, how does the cosmic process actually work? And that's what I've been describing in these other teachings, which are complementary to the teachings of the five skull crown hmm. instruction. And that's probably already too much to say, hmm. but that's what I have to say. Always a pleasure to talk with you. And um, it's, an, it's an honor to have you on my show. Thank you. What we do is productive and conversation works and so i do wish that it goes to the benefit of everyone who hears it <laughs>